Luffy is the hero of the story. He was always destined to be Joy Boy, the prophesied savior of the world. Honestly, just the same as Luffy is Joy Boy, Joy Boy is also Luffy. Separating the two is nonsensical. But just because this is how the story is, doesn't mean that it couldn't have ever been different. Throughout the adventure, and especially at the beginning, characters in the story remark in surprise that Zoro was not the captain of the Stride Pirates. There is definitely something special about Zoro. So a hypothetical question to ponder into the abyss, what if Zoro was supposed to be the person of prophecy and not Luffy? What if Zoro was the person to have eaten the Gomu Gomu no Mi? I know that this isn't the story of One Piece as we know it, but in the world of Two Piece, anything is possible. I want to present to you a very different and darker story. Let's see how it could work and what would happen. Hey YouTube, Joe Boy here. So, I wanted to craft this in the most compelling way that I could, and you guys will have to let me know by the end if I succeeded. So let's begin even before the story itself began. In this version, Dragon is the one to take the Gomu Gomu no Mi from Cypherpole and not Shanks. So when the Revolutionary Army arrived to Shimotsuke Village where Zoro grew up, they have the fruit so that Zoro can be the one to eat it. But Luffy is still an important character too, he just won't have the Gomu Gomu no Mi, so his story plays out approximately the same. Except he has to develop as a fighter more similar to his grandpa or Goldie Roger or Shanks himself and learn how to fight earlier without a powerful devil fruit. So Luffy still encounters Shanks. He is still captured by bandits. Shanks still goes and rescues him and gives him the straw hat. Because even though Luffy does not possess the Gomu Gomu no Mi, he's still saying the same things that Roger said. Shanks believes that one day he might acquire the fruit and be the future. It just needs to be understood that in this universe, Shanks doesn't know where the fruit is. So who has the fruit is not necessarily deciding who he's going to bet the future on. I think that Shanks was looking for a member of the D family who was most similar to Roger. And Luffy is, even without the fruit. So just the same, Luffy spends 10 years training before setting out to gather his pirate crew. And likewise, in Shimotsuke Village, Zoro is training too. But despite the fact that he has eaten a devil fruit, he still desires to be the world's strongest swordsman. Sword play matters a lot to him. But a popular theory is that a devil fruit slightly changes a person's nature to better reflect that of the fruit. So Zoro with the Gomu Gomu no Mi is not quite the same. Once awakened in Tunika, it's clear that this fruit allows someone to materialize their imagination. So I would say that child Zoro was imaginative. I mean, like, that dude uses three sword style, nobody else in the world seems to have grasped that concept. But the Gomu Gomu has only made this effect stronger, while instilling within him a greater desire for freedom. But I don't want you to overreact to this. This is important to mention and you'll understand by the end of the video. However, Zoro is not a totally different person. I just think that somebody doing what they want to do in the way that they want to do it always encourages them to smile like Nika. The fruit helps this. So while initially Zoro thought that the fruit was a major inconvenience, he eventually realized how he could utilize it in order to improve his swordsmanship. Just imagine Zoro's limbs as well as his head just flailing around with his sword. Honestly, it could be legitimately strong. But mastering this is even more challenging than three sword style itself. There is a steep learning curve, so he still loses to Koina. And he doesn't view himself as invincible because rubber is still weak to slashing attacks, meaning he isn't automatically a top tier swordsman just because of the fruit. But given enough time, the devil fruit does actually make a difference for Zoro's reputation. I still think that he becomes a notorious bounty hunter, and he gets really dang good at it, even better than he is in the actual story because he is now immune to bullets. But despite actually being stronger with a greater reputation, Zoro does not challenge the Grand Line mainly because he gets lost every time he tries. That's still a thing, I don't know why that would change. All this being said, his story still leads to Shellstown. He still meets Axe Hand Morgan, and he still gets tied to the post. Because Morgan didn't actually defeat him, Zoro turned himself in, almost like a challenge to himself. And it's there that he meets Monkey D. Luffy, who is the same, but also slightly different. I would call him an edgier version of Luffy. Battle scars and injuries cover his body and his arms, the result of intense training without his fruit. But his bright, wide, smile remains the same. So Luffy frees Zoro, he defeats Axe Hand Morgan, and the two set out on their adventure. Importantly here, Luffy is still the captain, because although Zoro desires more freedom generally, he still wants to be the world's strongest swordsman, not the king of the pirates like Luffy. So if it helps you, think about it like this. Zoro recruited Luffy as his captain, somebody worthy of being his captain, in the same way that Luffy as captain recruits all the members of his crew. For Zoro, not being the captain does not undermine his dreams. So Zoro absolutely could freely choose to be a subordinate, even with the Gomu Gomu no Mi. So for the two to pursue their dreams together, Luffy 
Luffy can be the captain and Zoro accepts this, at least initially. So basically from here on out, the East Blue remains relatively the same because Zoro allows Luffy to fight the bosses, in part because there is a certain kind of fighter that Zoro is compelled to fight, somebody who wields a sword. In any other case, it doesn't matter, so long as the opponent is defeated. And just remember, in this universe, Luffy without the fruit is still really strong. In Orge Town, they defeat Buggy and recruit Nami. In Syrup Village, they defeat Kuro and recruit Usopp. And even the Barate is the same. Like I said earlier, Zoro is still weak to slashing attacks and Mihawk is definitely still way out of his league. I do think that Mihawk acknowledges Zoro though, because he's still at his heart a swordsman. And ultimately, it is for this reason that he spares him. So Zoro leaves the Barate badly injured, just the same. Nami abandons the crew and Sanji joins it. But I do wonder if the Gomu Gomu no Mi helps Zoro's rate of recovery. It's just something that I've noticed with Luffy, no matter how injured he gets, it doesn't seem like it bothers him quite the same way that it bothers Zoro in the actual story. So I want you to keep this in mind as we continue, because Zoro's injuries at the hand of Miyak are actually relevant for the entire pre-time skip. But ultimately, Arlong Park remains the same. Zoro is still heavily injured in that arc. But there's a subtle difference at the conclusion of that arc. Originally, Luffy was the only one to receive a bounty having defeated Arlong, but now Zoro is simply too famous. It seems people are not entirely sure who the captain of the Strat Pirates is, so Zoro also receives a bounty of 30 million. And in his bounty poster, you can see him stretching. The world takes notice of this. They then arrive in Logtown, Smoker shows up, Luffy gets captured, Luffy gets saved by Dragon, Zoro still acquires the Sandai Kitetsu, and then they climb Reverse Mountain and arrive in the Grand Line. So the Grand Line itself begins relatively the same as it is in the actual story. While it is true that Zoro is the rubber man now and not Luffy, and Crocus is a member or prior member of Goldie Rogers crew, so that should be significant to him, he didn't actually hint that he knew anything about that when we saw him in the actual story, so I presume that the same will be the case here. But I do want to highlight something, and that's Luffy allowing Vivi to travel with him. In the actual story, Zoro wasn't all about that, and it had a lot to do with Vivi being a villain when she was first introduced, overall an annoyance and clearly not their ally. So it might be important to say that Luffy is not suddenly smarter because he lacks the Gomu Gomu no Mi. Likewise, Zoro isn't suddenly less smart. So Zoro's mistrust of a character like Vivi has a lot to do with logic. Logic, which certainly isn't a talent or a priority for Luffy. So this marks the first time in the story where Zoro really starts to question the judgment of his captain. Like, it's no shock to Zoro that Luffy is probably missing a few brain cells. But when you're inviting your enemies to travel with you, it crosses is a kind of line where Zoro starts to realize, hey, maybe Luffy needs some help with this captaincy thing. So this is actually the premise of Whiskey Peak. Zoro is on red alert because Luffy hasn't invited an enemy to travel with them, he's been lured into a trap, and to Zoro it is obvious. But instead of trying to control Luffy or tell Luffy what to do, instead he is just vigilant. Zoro doesn't think that it's a big idea to simply notice what it is that Luffy can't do and then do that thing for him. And basically here, Luffy is just easily fooled. And this version of Zoro still has the power of skepticism. But you guys already know what ultimately happened. Zoro fought all of Baroque works, ultimately saved the strats, Luffy wakes up, thinks Zoro has hurt his friends, and then attack Zoro. In this version of the story, Zoro is actually stronger, but he doesn't have enough time to defeat Luffy. But as they fight, as Zoro measures the difference between them, he knows he's stronger. And this is the first time that the thought truly enters his mind. Is Luffy deserving of being his captain? Is he going to get everybody killed? Should he instead be the captain? But he pushes past this thought because they still have things to do. Vivi is now officially traveling with them and they are in a collision course with Alabasta. I think that Little Garden and Drum Island play out about the same. And then we have Alabasta at Itself. Being a rubber man does not help Zoro in his fight against Daz Bones, Mr. One. He still has to learn how to cut steel in order to defeat him. Honestly, if you sit down and think about it, there's a possibility. There's a world where Daz Bones straight up defeats Luffy in Alabaster because of how hard his fruit counters rubber. But fortunately, Zoro has swords. However, the Luffy and Crocodile fight does change because Luffy can no longer use Mizu Luffy. He needed the ability to absorb and suck up water in order to damage Crocodile a Logia user. So instead here, something different happens. I think that Luffy's armament hockey starts to emerge. Without a double fruit, this skill needs to develop for Luffy to simply survive. So what I think is that Luffy minus the Gomu Gomu no Mi, the 
mentors around him, Shanks and Garp, knew that hockey would be something that he would need to learn. So he was informed about this earlier. Because in this story, he's not invulnerable and his body wears these scars. But of course, it takes certain circumstances for hockey to bloom, and I think a fight with Crocodile would have done that. In that fight, Luffy needed armament, and so he achieved it enough in order to win, blindsiding the overconfident Crocodile. This jump in power level was important. Zoro notices this, but there's a twist to end the arc. Once again, Luffy allows another former enemy to actually this time join their crew, Nico Robin. Zoro simply cannot understand why he would take that risk. So once again, he chooses to remain vigilant because he does not entirely trust his captain's decision. This leads to Jaya, which plays out approximately the same. The crew travel up the knock upstream and arrive to the Sky Islands, but the Sky Islands are very different. The ruler of the sky is God Anel, and with his lightning logia, double fruit, as well as his insane mantra ability, this foe is a serious problem for Luffy. So here we have our first major twist of the Grand Line. Luffy possesses armament hockey, that's true, but it isn't quite enough. Anel is simply too strong. And at the same time, Zoro is simply too strong. He realizes that he is made out of rubber, he is immune to Anel's attacks, and so he decides that Anel should be his opponent. And no one can really argue that. So for the first official time, Zoro ends up taking out the boss of the arc. At this point, Zoro is really wondering whether or not he needs Luffy, and the crew are noticing this as well. Taking Luffy's job is kind of a big deal. Yet despite the subtle tension that this cultivates in the background of the Strat crew, they float down from the Sky Islands and arrive to Long Ring Longland, and that arc plays out unchanged. They then encounter Aokiji, and Aokiji still freezes everybody, ultimately sparing them because of Luffy's sacrifice. He of course warns them about Nico Robin, they then get to Water 7, that plays out, Nico Robin betrays them just as Zoro anticipated that she might. Then to add insult to injury, Usopp challenges Luffy and leaves the crew regarding the going merry. Finally, Zoro says some of the things that he'd been thinking. Deserve to be my captain or find out. And eventually CP9 is unmasked and Zoro and Luffy fight them. But they still lose and get stuck, leading to a crazy pursuit of Nico Robin through Aqua Laguna and arriving in Innie's lobby. But so here's the thing about Innie's lobby. Having been defeated, Zoro is ready for his next power-up, but it occurs in two ways. He unlocks the sword technique Ashra, and his imagination being sparked by the Gomu Gomu no Mi, he also unlocks gear second and gear third. He then puts the techniques together, and this leads him to totally obliterate Kaku. You also need to keep in mind that at this point he has a Gomu Gomu no Mi, he heals faster hypothetically, though his injury at the hands of Mihawk is now a distant memory, meaning he's even more prepared for another fight after that. Luffy is also making gains regarding Haki, but Luchi is still high diff. Zoro already took out the boss of the last major arc in and out, so to him it's not a big deal to see Luffy still fighting Luchi and decide to join him. At the first signs of struggle. So Luffy and Zoro team up, they quickly defeat Luchi, but now their rivalry is really starting to get real. Luffy is getting mad. Zoro is effectively taking his job. And the reality is, is that the accumulated damage of the adventure and of the Grand Line is starting to add up for Luffy. He's truly beginning to push himself to extreme levels, and his body is struggling to keep up. So they end up escaping Annie's lobby because the Going Merry rescues them. They get back to Water 7, and there is a fight between Luffy and Zoro. Luffy tells him, do not take the boss again. I will defeat Defeat my opponents. And Zoro says, okay, let's see. So they acquire the Thousand Sunny, Frankie joins the crew, and Usopp rejoins the crew. But there is definitely a dark weight hovering over the strats as they head to Thriller Bark. Luffy is desperate to prove that he is worthy. And fortunately, the people there have been gathering shadows, which Luffy can still utilize. Nightmare Luffy is still a thing, because it's really just about willpower. So this arc ultimately plays out the same, although Zoro absolutely contributes to the defeat of Oars. But by the arc's conclusion, Luffy is spent, and then Kuma arrives. I think that Zoro still takes Luffy's pain, because it's a challenge. But at the same time, Kuma recognizes that Zoro possesses the Gomu Gomu no Mi, and has Nika-like properties. Honestly, to Kuma, the Strat crew itself is even more interesting than it is in the actual story because he still saw Luffy growing up and knows that he is Dragon's son. But at this point, Zoro and Luffy have equal bounties, and Kuma also sees them as equals, not as captain and subordinate. So Zoro tanks the pain and leaves Kuma with something to think about. However, with most of his pain now gone, Luffy is rejuvenated as the Strats complete their adventure of the Paradise portion of the Grand Line and arrive to Sabaody. But we know how this arc went. Kami gets enslaved, Luffy punches a celestial dragon, and the crew meet Rayleigh. However, this time Rayleigh has some interest in Zoro. The only real difference in this fight is that because Zoro is healthy, he now survives 
longer than he did in the actual manga. So this time both Luffy and Zoro watch as all of the other strats are pushed away by Kuma, leaving just Luffy and Zoro together in the wake of their crew's defeat. And it's at this point that Zoro finally realizes Luffy's recklessness doomed them. But here's the interesting twist. Kuma now perceives Luffy and Zoro differently. He sees the unresolved conflict within the strat pirates themselves. And he sees that Zoro and Luffy have unresolved conflict. So rather than sending Zoro to Mihawk, instead he sends both Zoro and Luffy together to Amazon Lily. At first, it's a relief traveling in the sky together that the other Straw Hats aren't dead. Kuma didn't kill them, meaning the Straw Hat crew can be reformed. It's just that they won't be doing this together. At this moment, Zoro has snapped. He doesn't take defeat well, and he decides to blame Luffy. Zoro sees Luffy as unnecessary. He is more fit to be the captain. And when they touch down, Zoro tells him this. When the Straw Hat pirates regroup, only one of them will be captain. He will fight Luffy for that right. But this battle gets delayed by the women of Amazon Lily. Chaos ensues, they encounter Boa Hand and Luffy unleashes Conqueror's Hockey, which surprises and impresses Zoro. At the same time, another surprising thing happens. Boa Hancock falls in love with Luffy, and it's about here that Zoro starts to recognize how throughout the course of their adventure, Luffy acquires friends and allies easily, even from among their enemies. Essentially, Zoro starts to realize that he might have made a mistake and acted too hastily, but he finds himself in an Usopp situation. Things have been said that can't be unsaid, and he still has his pride. I think that he's honestly glad when fate intervenes to stop their fight with the reveal that Ace had been captured and was scheduled for execution in Marineford. Hearing this, Luffy totally forgot about Zoro, and he asked for his help to go rescue his brother. One last adventure, then they could have their fight. It was a promise. So Zoro agreed, and with the help of Boa Hancock, they infiltrated and fell down. And here, Zoro was actually more of a hindrance than Luffy, mainly because of his lack of directionality, impel down being a literal maze. But at this point, Zoro fully regrets ever having challenged Luffy. Despite Zoro being arrogant, Luffy is his friend and is instead hyper aware of the things that Luffy offers to the crew and to Zoro that Zoro himself can't provide. The Impel Down arc illustrates this perfectly, as Zoro is there to witness characters like Buggy and Crocodile, Jinbei, Emporio Ivankov, Mr. Two, and Mr. Three all end up as allies, every single one of them proving crucial in some way, aiding them in their escape. He also sees Luffy's determination. He will win or he will die, and that's powerful. So the jailbreak of Impel Down remains the same, and this time Luffy and Zoro both take this group of misfits to Marineford, where they arrive to the battlefield in the very same damn way. And it's here that I think that the message finally hits home. Because Zoro is not any more effective than Luffy, in fact, he is less effective than Luffy. Because Luffy is aided by literally everyone around him. Zoro sees Mihawk and challenges him to a duel. And once again, Zoro is not ready, and he loses, although he does not die. But while his pursuit to the center is stalled heavily, he can only look on in awe as Luffy continues to press forward, some way, somehow. It's in the midst of all of this that he finally decides that he will swallow his pride and apologize to Luffy. He had made a mistake. Luffy was absolutely deserving of being his captain. And you need to understand all of this profoundly affects Zoro because of how dishonorable his actions were. Instead of helping his captain, he stood in his way, all because he realized the truth too late, that being a captain is more than just your ability to fight. You cannot succeed on an adventure like this without strong and capable friends. And in this respect, Luffy is like a magnet. Yet despite Luffy's accumulating injuries, Zoro can't help but to smile when he sees Luffy finally rescue Ace, and then it's time to retreat. He thinks to himself, only my captain could have accomplished this. But then something unexpected happens. As Zoro is rushing to Luffy to help him, thinking about how to say sorry, Luffy begins to stumble, and then he falls down, almost immediately after rescuing Ace. Ace hurriedly picks him up, but his breathing is labored. Zoro arrives too, and asks what's wrong with Luffy. But the simple truth is that his body couldn't take it any longer. The last Ivankov injection was fatal. He rescued Ace, and then he died. Zoro only had a brief moment to tell him that he was sorry. With his last bit of strength, Luffy grabs his strap hat and places it on Zoro's head. He asks Zoro to return the straw hat to Shanks and to protect their friends. And with that, the light in Luffy's eyes blinked out and Zoro lost a brother. Ultimately, I still think that Ace turns around when provoked by a Kainu and so Ace dies shortly afterwards. Shanks arrives to stop the war and it's in that moment that Zoro tries to return the straw hat, but Shanks tells him to keep it. He is a straw hat pirate after all. And we of course know that Shanks sees the potential that Zoro has given his devil fruit. Effectively, Zoro has replaced Luffy although Shanks wouldn't say it. Zoro returns to Amazon Lily, determined to reform the Strahd crew and honor Luffy's memory. 3D2Y is initiated by Zoro, and in the picture printed in newspapers across the world, he is now wearing the straw hat, which communicates that he is now the captain, and that's how the crew take it. Zoro
Nora then prepares to train for two years, but not under Mihawk. Instead, it's Rayleigh, just the same as Luffy. Because little known fact, Rayleigh was actually a former world's strongest swordsman, and was the one to train Shanks, while well, being the second in command on Gold Roger's ship. But with this, a definitive page is turned in the Straw Hat Pirates adventure. It turns out that Zoro was the hero after all. It was just a long and windy road to get there. So I want to slow down and take a breath and sort of process the story that we've created. With Zoro eating the Gomu Gomu no Mi, he needs to at some point be the sun god Nika, the savior of the story but we're not changing the nature of that character. So in essence, we have to make Zoro more like Nika and more like Luffy. So I tried to accomplish this in a number of ways. First off, the fruit slightly changes his nature, but secondly, it's the rivalry surrounding captaincy of the strats which allows Zoro to learn from Luffy. Because part of what makes Luffy Luffy is that he is an idiot. And I don't think that this is a product of his fruit. He was just born a little derby. But the interesting thing is that throughout the actual story, Oda has almost justified this, like Luffy being an idiot is part of what makes him the perfect candidate to save the world. He takes chances other people wouldn't. He trusts people when other people wouldn't. Like, I don't want to sit here and spend minutes trying to analyze Luffy's character. I think that you guys understand he's just perfect the way he is. Perfect. And it's the fact that he doesn't play the game like everybody else that's so endearing. It helps him acquire friends. And as Mihawk tells us in Marineford, his ability to acquire friends is the single most fearsome ability in the entire world. So while it's a fun discussion to compare Zoro to Luffy, I think a lot of people thought that Zoro might make for a better captain at certain junctures, right? But at the end of the day, Zoro just lacks what is required. Over and over, the actual story has hammered that in. So in this version, we have Zoro sort of focusing in on Luffy as a leader and then coming to learn what exactly it is that Luffy provides, and then when Luffy dies, I feel like that's enough motivation for Zoro to try to become more like him. And if for no other reason, this makes a ton of sense if Zoro intends to keep the Strat crew together, right? They were all recruited under Luffy's leadership, so now that Zoro is the leader and he recognizes how great Luffy was at it, it would just make sense for him to try to emulate it. All of this, in my opinion, allows for Zoro to eventually be able to awaken the Gomu Gomu no Mi. To do that, in my opinion, he needs to make the adventure, no matter what happens, fun. It's all about having fun. But I think that we should also just be real that no matter how hard Zoro tries, he can never be just the same as Luffy because he is not Luffy. So this has to be a version of Nika that is Zoro. And honestly, I think that a lot of people could imagine that if you dumbed up Luffy, right, that could benefit uh, the story, like the hero of the world, might actually be a little bit smarter than Luffy, and just inspired by him. And despite this being a hypothetical that has no basis in reality whatsoever, just totally made up for my brain, right, I could see that. With the fruit itself, it sparks his sense of adventure. It helps him have fun. But Zoro absolutely is capable of having fun. We saw that at the very beginning of the story. Pre-time skip, early pre-time skip, Zoro was a riot. That version of Zoro has slowly slipped away, but we saw it. It existed. So to me, that's an easy problem to solve. The harder problem to solve is, Zoro using logic. And the best way to approach this is just make it logical to act like Luffy. But again, just full disclosure, right? We know that Luffy has a particular ability, a talent, innate, to be able to read the room or sense other people's intentions or their feelings. Man's EIQ is through the roof. Yes, it's true that Luffy can be easily tricked, but he also has a spidey sense when somebody needs help or that somebody has a good heart. Zoro straight up lacks this. And as far as potentially learning this as a personality trait, that's totally impossible. Maybe we can pretend like the fruit helps him in some way, or maybe it's a form of hockey that he can develop. But yeah, if you ask me, this is probably the hole in this hypothetical. But another thing that Luffy does that helps him as a captain is he knows when there's things that he cannot do. That's why every single member of the Strats is so important. Because without them, the thing doesn't work. So to bring this together, right, if the Strats lose Luffy, then another position is open on the crew itself. So as we've made up everything prior, what I would do is I would introduce a new character in the story who can not necessarily be Luffy, but provide some of the things that the crew now lacks without Luffy. So in this what if, right? Luffy has died, and this is news that reaches the entire world. It even reaches Vivi in Alabasta. She's obviously heartbroken. She wonders to herself, maybe if she'd been there, things would have gone differently. So Zoro asks a favor to Rayleigh to get a message to Vivi, essentially asking her once again to join the crew, letting her know that they aren't done, and that they need her help. And like straight up, Zoro knows that this was Luffy's will. Luffy chose Vivi as a straw head candidate. 
she was worthy. There's no better person to invite first. And I think that her skill set works perfectly with the dynamics that we have going on from the very start of the new world. But I don't really think that it's necessary to go through the entire post time skip here in great detail because I think at this point we've changed too much. Like seriously, what do you do after Luffy literally dies if Vivi joins the crew and now Zoro has an entirely different role? Too many words. So the finale of this video really sits here during the two year time skip. But for those that want the idea to sort of complete itself, I would try as hard as I can to make sure that the story is as close as possible to what we actually got, meaning that we visit the same islands, we encounter the same bosses, all of it leading to Wano where Zoro awakens the devil fruit. Basically, you can just think about Zoro as being Luffy, and that'll be close enough to the truth. But I'm sure you're wondering about Zoro as the world's strongest swordsman, and basically guys, I think that Zoro inherits Luffy's dream, but he also has his own dream as well, so Zoro will intend to become the king of the pirates just like Luffy, but also the world's strongest swordsman. He wants to be the King of the Pirates, who is also the world's strongest swordsman. These two dreams are not mutually exclusive. You can accomplish both of them at the same time, being the same person. I don't see why not. Like, low-key, wasn't that something that Shanks almost was? I'm just gonna call this foreshadowing. It was a different video, but it was also one I was kind of excited about because I felt like I could do something with it. But at the same time, I just know that there's gonna be a ton of people in the comments that are gonna be like, well, I like Luffy the way Luffy is. I like Zoro the way that Zoro is. And changing them is kind of, you miss the assignment for what these videos are supposed to be like. And all I got to say to that is sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. My body is prepared for the hate. I've been training my whole life for this. But yeah, if you wanna take this hypothetical a different way or different to how I did it, then just let me know. The comment section is at your disposal. With something like this, I'm sure that there's always more that you could say. I could have said, but did not. But the world of fan fiction, I think, is kind of interesting now that we've fully immersed ourselves right there's it seems like to me there's two ways of doing it like you either keep the characters all of the characters exactly as they are and then you put the characters in like different circumstances how would they react and then you know you change the characters so that the story itself is different i think i prefer it the way that we did it that's how it's more interesting to me anyway i'm just rambling at this point in time i guess what i really want to know is if you guys enjoyed it hit the thumbs up let me know if i have another idea that genuinely excites me should i expect a riot or not that way we know whether i'm intentionally or accidentally digging my own grave but overall I had a really fun time brainstorming this video and i hope that you guys enjoyed it if you're interested in checking out my book the booms link will be in the description shout out to the members of this channel like the video subscribe click the bell to be notified join the squad and as always guys have a wonderful day